Hi, happy Easter church. Good morning. Welcome to the Resurrection Sunday. This is Easter. Today is the day, the day of all days, the day that defines all our days. It's Easter, friends. Are you sure? You ask? Yep, I am sure. I checked the calendar. I made sure I asked Alexa, is it Easter? Yep. Okay. True, this is the first Easter in my entire life that I've not been in a church building. And that's probably true for many of you. But don't fret, friends. Just because our church is empty, guess what? The tomb is also empty. Empty is the word of the day. Jesus is not there. Why? Because he's here. He's everywhere. He's with us, wherever we are, wherever that is. On earth, in heaven, there is nothing that locks him out now. He is everywhere. Jesus is with everyone who calls upon him today or any day. We don't have to go peeking into a tomb to find him. We know that he will find us. You see, one part of the Easter story is how Jesus goes about to people. He, the morning he pops in, in our Bible study this morning, he popped in on the women and said, Greetings! Hi! He walks with those on the way to Emmaus. He is with disciples on the beach. He shows up because Jesus is risen. He has the ability to go anywhere, to be all things, to be with all people. In that, God shows up that there is nothing beyond God. That there will be a day when the rock is rolled away from our doors as well. That we too will have those abilities to walk on beaches and to walk down roads. Jesus has shown us that this is possible. There is hope. Jesus models hope for us. You know, I was thinking about this. I'm showing you this with my um, praying hands. And... I'm thinking about what it would be like not to have Jesus. You know, that, that thought if we, right now in this crisis, I didn't have hope. How do you live without Jesus? And I think a lot of people are wondering uh, that right now. Those who are atheists, how are they making it through this? How would you do without hope? You know, with right now, Jesus is giving me the hope to make it through all of this. My quarantine buddies would tell you at times I'm losing my mind, but I think that's normal. But without hope, you would completely lose it. And I'm telling you that because that's what happens to the disciples. They are just like many right now. And it wasn't that they had fears over losing a friend. They had lost a friend. They had lost a loved one. They had lost a leader. But even more so, they had lost their Messiah, their God, their hope into reality. And they thought he was gone for good. They were shaken to their very core. Today we're going to look at John 20, and it says in John 20, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. They were locked in their house because they were afraid to go out for fear of death. Wow, does that sound familiar? Well, when I was thinking about Easter, I heard a lot of us in that in John 20. Now all four of the Gospels are going to tell you the resurrection story. And if you look at our Sunrise Bible study from this morning, you're going to hear from Matthew. And I've preached on some of these other stories you know well, but I really want to stay today with John 20 because I think um, they say sometimes pastors preach what they need to hear. And I'm hoping you also need to hear this because I found hope in this message. Um, give me just a second. The computer moved on me. John 20 starts, as we heard um, going into it, this notion of a different kind of Easter. So how does it begin? And I love that we have some art here that I put up for you, but I want to give it a little more space. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. We talked about dark on the night of Monday, Thursday. But I also think it's important for us to know that the hope of Easter starts in the dark. Starts in the time when it doesn't feel like the light is shining. When we're still confused, we're tired, we're frustrated, life is out of control, we're afraid, we can't see the end to the long night. That's when Easter starts. It doesn't start in the sunrise. It says, while it was still dark. When we were almost ready to give up, something, something miraculous occurs. God will work in the dark. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So clearly, what we know from this is that Mary is an early riser. She's one of you weird morning doves, said by a true night owl. And she's up in the dark, doing rounds, checking on things. She's heading to the tomb. 
And as she's doing that, she noticed that something's amiss. Something's not right. And it's not just that she hasn't had her coffee. She knows that there's something wrong here. The stone, a huge stone, has been rolled away. Now, what's the importance of the stone? Well, the stone has a few things of importance that it does in this story and in any story. They put it in front of a tomb so that wild animals do not bother the bodies because they had wild animals then. They also had a fear of the smell. If you remember the story of Lazarus, they didn't want Jesus to move things out because the stench would be too much. And in some of our gospel stories, there's a notion that the rock is there because the guards can guard it from the disciples taking the body away. But the rock is also a metaphor for us. A rock is like a closed door, a shut-off opportunity, a missed dream. And some people are feeling that right now in the midst of the coronavirus. Some people are feeling like something has shut on them, not just the literal doors, but physical, emotional, mental, spiritual doors. Like worlds are being cut off. Loved ones are being lost to the virus. Others are facing unemployment. We can't visit our seniors in nursing homes. Children are being abused at home because they're safe place with school, and they're losing valuable social and educational moments. The rock locks one in and another out. It blocks the path and the humanity. We, as humans, go and we can't take that rock away. The women really are concerned about who's going to move the rock. Because sometimes we can't move the rock. Only God can. And God does. If there was ever a time that we would understand the image of needing God to remove the rock from the door of our life, it would be this year. And it's true, God rolls stones all the time. God makes opportunities and openings for us all the time. Sometimes we just don't notice them. But when we think about right now, one of the great rolled stones is the ability to have science. For scientists to have the knowledge of what's going on in our world, to be able to make vaccines. God is rolling stones right and left. And God is saying, this too shall pass. I will make a new way. You will not be in the closed tomb forever. For God has already opened that door. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken my Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where to find him. Where have they laid him? Some in our world feel like God is also missing, like God isn't around. Some can't find that hope. They feel like God has been taken somewhere, and they don't know where. Now, for some, that is a feeling of loss and confusion. But for others, like myself sometimes, it feels strange not being to worship together. Like the traditional notions of our God aren't there. But just because we aren't gathering together doesn't mean they've taken our Lord. Amen? But what we feel and what Mary feels almost is confining in that way. You see, it's different this year. Jesus is right here with us. He's in my home. He's in your home. He's wherever you're viewing this. Even though she didn't know where they had laid him, he was already right there with her. He's meeting people, showing love and mercy. You know, I got to thinking about this, and I realized something. We want to keep Jesus in the tomb because we know where he is when he's there. We like having our Jesus locked in so that we know on Sunday mornings he's there. But what about the other days of the week? We know where we last left Jesus. But Jesus says, hey... I'm doing wonderful things beyond your imagination. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running. They were running. Imagine this. They're going away. They're heading to see what they can see, trusting Mary. And the other disciple, the really fast one, outruns Peter and reaches the tomb first. He bent down and looked inside and saw the linen wrappings lying there. But... He did not go in. Sometimes God's miracles overwhelm us. The real power of Easter, when we face it, can almost stop us in our tracks. If we really embrace all that God is possible to achieve, all that is probable with God at the helm of our lives, it can almost stop us, overwhelm us, make us numb. When we face the possibility of everlasting grace, beyond our human recognition of reality. The running disciple can't go in. 
Sometimes hope is right before us, isn't it? And we don't see it. We stop and let other things take precedence. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Great Divorce, talks about how to really embrace Christ and the resurrection. We have to let everything else go. But are we ready to do that? Or do we stand outside the tomb? I have thought of that too much before, isn't it? Other people live their whole lives in survival mode. That their faith is strengthened because they know only God matters to them. The story continues. Then Simon Peter, Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. Peter, I will have to say, can be a pain sometimes, but you cannot fault him for being a man of action. Rather right or wrong, he does it. He heads straight first into that tomb, facing death and life all in a glimpse. And what he finds is the linen wrappings lying there. The cloth that had been on Jesus' head... Now, eventually, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first and stopped goes in after Peter does. And it says, they, he saw and believed. And that seems great, right? He saw and believed. But here's the part I love. Ready? The next line says, for they yet did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They saw and believed, but they didn't yet understand what it was about. So what are they believing? What are they seeing and knowing is true? I wonder if, like Mary, they believed that somebody had taken the body. They had all the evidence and miracles all around them, and yet they couldn't put the pieces together. It was like a puzzle. The one of those like 1,000 piece puzzles that you, I don't know, maybe you're one of those people that can do them, but I often find that I get to a certain point and I'm like, ah, right? Well, that's what the disciples are feeling. All the pieces are laid out there, but they can't put it together. And so what happens? Ready for this? Then the disciples return to their home. Did you remember that line? They faced the empty tomb. They saw the linens. They had heard from Mary. And Mary's out in the garden crying at this point. But they don't know what it means. They believe something's happened. They're not sure what. So they go home. Is that us? Do we face Easter and think, so what? Let's just stay in our homes. It's just another day. Or do we face Easter and have it shape our whole story? Have it change the way that we stay in our homes so that we become messengers of what we have seen and heard and known to be true? Do you see the difference? It's not the location. It's the attitude. We believe. And that changes our world, wherever we are. I'm thinking of hope a lot lately. I've been watching the Smithsonian's Cheetah Cub Cam, and I've posted it a couple times on my Facebook. If you haven't seen it yet, just go to the Smithsonian and type in Cheetah Cub Cam, and I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Echo the Cheetah has four cubs that were born on April 8th. And I love animals, but what's so amazing to me about this is new life in spring, yes, but new life that's close to extinction in spring. That's the Easter message, isn't it? When all seems lost, when things seem like it's the end, God says, hold on, here's some hope. God makes an appearance and says, here's some joy, now enjoy it. I imagine that in all our lives, there is this Easter feeling at times, right? Of, I can't do this, God. I give up, God. And that's when God says, well, I can do this. I will do this. That is when God makes the appearance with angels in white sitting on the tomb saying, Hey, look what's really going on. And the angels come in this moment. The disciples have gone home, but Mary's still crying out there. And they say to her, Woman, why are you weeping? In other words, God has done amazing things. Why are you still stuck on what God hasn't done? Or what God isn't doing in your mind? Why are you still stuck on what was lost and not what was found? You have your proof, and yet you humanity, you silly humanity, don't see what's going on. Now, the angels don't have a long conversation with her because something else happens. Jesus shows up, and he says those same words. Woman, why are you weeping? It always reminds me of Peter Pan. Why are you stuck? Why are you lost? What are you missing? He was right there with her, and she didn't know it was him. How many days in our life has God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit been right there with us, and we didn't see them? 
We were stuck on what had gone wrong and not what had gone right. Later today, I'm going to actually read you a book called The Ragman. It's a short story by Walter Rangren Jr. And you'll hear some of this Jesus Among Us language. Now, Jesus and Mary have a lovely scene, but we've done it before in church, so I invite you to go read it on your own. Instead, I want to jump down to verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were what? Locked for fear of the Jews. See, there's that part I mentioned. The, the disciples on Easter are locked in their house for fear of going outside. The disciples were like us. They were on a stay-at-home order. We are like the first Easter more than we've ever been. We know that feeling of isolation, of locked tombs, of locked rooms. We know uh, their emotions more than we could have ever understood in a splashy Easter service. Now, don't get me wrong. I love splashy Easter services. But maybe this year we can garner some truth that we couldn't have before. Maybe there's a value that we can connect in mutual understanding with the disciples. Maybe we can also connect with our brothers and sisters in Africa who are afraid to leave their houses because of malaria. Or maybe others that face this kind of isolation on a regular day, like those in our nursing homes when people don't visit them. So what does Jesus say to us in solidarity? What did he say to Mary? He said, peace be with you. If we can learn something from this Easter in our solidarity, if it is peace, then what a beautiful Easter miracle it would be. Then after saying it, he shows them his hands. He shows the disciples the scars on his hands, the wound to prove that, yes, he had died and risen. Now, many of you have scarred hands, especially our nurses and care providers and our doctors. You have faces that are marked by masks and hands that are scarred by washing. We also all going to have emotional cuts, aren't we? We're going to have grief and isolation, fear of trust. When we come out of this, we're going to be like Jesus with scars on our hands and on our hearts. But Jesus said, I've done that too, friends. And I made it through. I showed you that you can. It says the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And it goes on. And that's enough of the story for today, except right at verse 30, it says, now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But those that are written are so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. His dying on the cross gave us the opportunity. The shared story of his resurrection and the beauty of the miracle that it is gave us life. Now it's up to us to hold that belief. Do we stop at the tomb afraid to go in? Do we run in and then go home not knowing anything about what happened? Are we stuck outside the tomb crying? Are we those gathered in locked rooms waiting to see the brokenness of Jesus and the redemption of us all? Who are we on this Easter? Friends, the story has been the same story year after year. But who we are and what we bring to it changes it for us. Today, I invite you to take away new truths, new revelations for where you are now, knowing that with Jesus, it's always about newness of life in Easter, that it's always about the hope that you can receive. Jesus has been everywhere that we are. Jesus has experienced everything we can experience. He experiences it with us as well. Yes, friends, even though we are at home, this is Easter. For there is an open tomb, and there is hope to be found. For this is the day, the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, for he is risen. He is risen indeed. The tomb is open. I invite our hearts to be as well.